uh, a marsh's ability to to uh, to, um, to to change vertically, to accrete vertically. Um, in some other systems, like um, the southeast Atlantic coast, it's it's more sediment coming out of rivers. Um, but in reality, it's both. So we have really good measurements of how marshes um, build vertically. Uh, we have about a 20 year data set. Uh, we use these instruments called uh, uh, surface ed elevation tables, and I won't get into the details, but they, they help us measure how fast marshes are creating. And we've measured at three sites, three different marshes in uh, Cape Cod National Seashore, rates of about one to 2.8 millimeters per year. So not very much. Sea level rise, as I said, uh, at Nantucket at least, which is the closest long, uh, gauge to long-term data set, is about 3.8 millimeters per year. So this has already affected lots of uh, our marshes and in fact marshes all around uh, New England and um, one thing we we did to sort of assess how our marshes are responding to sea level rise and how they will respond is to look at what's happened in the recent past and to do this we used a series of aerial photographs and um, you know, using GIS tools we're able to map the extent of high marsh versus low marsh vegetation so so in our marshes they're they're generally defined by two major zones the the lower elevations that occur sort of below mean high tide and that's occupied by cord grass uh, and the higher elevations above mean high tide approximately are occupied by salt marsh hay or Spartina patens. And in aerial phot photography, those signatures are really distinct, so you can map out where they are exactly. Um, the high marsh is, is way more sensitive to sea level rise than, than the low marsh, which can take a, a much larger tidal range. And we, we've just seen the high marsh disappearing pretty rapidly over time. This is uh, the gut marsh in, in Wellfleet, and the, uh, the white polygons show the extent, the seaward extent of the high marsh in 1984. And by two, you know, this needs to be updated, but I, by 2013, you can see, as indicated by the black polygons, how, how much it's shrunk. So it's retreated upslope. You, know, you can say the same thing around all our marshes in Cape Cod where you know marshes that used to be primarily dominated by high marsh vegetation have now uh, completely converted to to low marsh. So a big change in habitat you, you can see it here in the aerial photography the light color signature is is the high marsh the darker signature is the uh, the dark gray is low marsh and you can see how much that has expanded and replaced the high marsh in um, in response to sea level rise over the last a uh, couple of decades. So in order to assess where our marshes are going in the future, one of the things we had to do is undertake this big project to get really accurate <clears throat> elevation data. It's really hard to do this in marshes using remote sensing because um, it's not very accurate. You can have an error of like 20 centimeters of vertical accuracy, vertical error, and that, you know, that makes a huge difference for marshes. Um, so we had people go out over the course of two years and and every one of those points, for example, in this West End marsh in Provincetown represents a location where uh, this RTK GPS unit was put down and a very accurate elevation read. And so we did, we collected, uh, I, our technicians and other people, not myself, collected uh, about 10,000 points worth of data. And from that, from that, um, I should also mention we, all, we also collect a very detailed and specific tidal data for each uh, specific marsh. But from that elevation data, we're able to interpolate that and create a nice kind of um, topography of the marsh, which is related to, to real elevations. Once we have that base map, we're able to produce a, a, a simple model using the elevations, the, the, the tidal elevations that we've measured, um, um, plus um, the vegetation types and productivity values from the literature, we're able to build all that into a model to predict how these marshes are going to respond to increased sea level rise. So if we add a meter of water, um, you know, on top of uh, where tide heights are already reaching, which is, you know, predicted for the, by, by 20, 2100, then we can figure out what the marsh is going to do. So just a couple examples of that analysis show again, um, in the top series is the gut marsh and well fleet. The, the white area is high marsh. Um, the, the gray area is existing uh, or low marsh and as you see the black part up here, that's marsh that's been lost or converted to mudflat. And you can see that based on 2013 uh, marsh elevations, um, with 50 centimeters, which is a very conservative scenario, or 100 centimeters of sea level rise, pretty much all the high marsh disappears, and we start to see the low marsh disappearing at a seaward edge as well. Let me just let that go. 
West End, again, same pattern. Um, again, the white part here is high marsh. The gray is low marsh. And with 50 centimeters of sea level rise, it's probably going to be a lot more than that. High marsh essentially all disappears. And with 100 centimeters, we start to lose significant portions of total marsh. The high marsh habitat in and of itself is really important because it's it, uh, an assemblage of unique plants and, and wildlife kind of lives and, and utilizes that part of the marsh. That salt marsh sparrow, for example, only nests in high marsh habitat and that's getting flooded out and replaced by low marsh. At Nosset Marsh, um, uh, this is of a particular concern of ours because um, we think that whole thing might disappear. I'll, I'll talk about that a little later here. Um, but so, so with sea level rise, it's inevitable. We're going to see huge vegetation changes and, you know, with at least a meter of sea level rise, which is sort of a conservative estimate, um, we're going to see significant marsh losses. The only way we can get salt marsh habitat back to compensate for those marshes, aside from tidal restoration, which is, is great, um, is if we allow marshes to migrate overland, to, to mi move up slope, to essentially escape flooding um, in response to sea level rise. So when sea level rise surpasses a marsh's ability to accrete vertically, as, as what's happening in, our, in our, our Cape Cod marshes, landward migration must occur. And, you know, we've seen that in the, um, the change in species composition in our marshes because that the boundary between low marsh, the tall stuff and high marsh, uh, the short uh, Spartina patens, is pretty abrupt in throughout New England. And you can, you can watch that boundary just shift landward. And that's, uh, you know, what I showed you in those, those previous photographs. There are, however, um, many constraints to overland mi migration. Uh, number one is probably human in infrastructure. We've, you know, developed right up to the edge of marshes. Um, there's also slope is important. So, um, sometimes there's natural barriers. In, in our marshes, we have uh, a lot of the uh, the high marshes surrounded by pretty steep slopes. So, you know, based on simple physics, they can't go very far with sea level rise um, against a steep slope. And then, one of the the big opportunities for overland migration or um, a development of marsh on higher elevations is is uh, on the backside of our barrier beaches, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that those beaches are going to deteriorate pretty rapidly with sea level rise. And although some of that sediment may supply the marshes behind it with with a little elevation boost, um, it, it's more likely that um, it, they're going to disappear, and, and and that available habitat is is just not going to be there for uh, upslope migration. All right, so we have those elevation maps from the from the previous project, and because we have those, we could determine, you know, we know exactly where um, uh, the high high tides uh, fall based on our tidal data and, and and the fact that we have those elevations, and then we can sort of model uh, what one meter putting one meter of sea level rise on top of that would do, and where the marshes could go in response to to that based on their uh, the topography of the surrounding upland. Um, so we sort of see the upland boundary there, and then you know we'll model out uh, how much of uh, that area could be potentially marsh if uh, um, given a certain level of sea level rise. Um, and that's that's what this figure shows. This is a little section of a marsh, just to show you an example. Um, the uh, the uh, with one meter of sea level rise again from previous modeling, this black area is marsh that's been lost to mudflat, converted to mudflat. And this white area now, the, the, the gray area represents total marsh, both high and low. And the white area represents where marsh could go based on the topography of the adjacent upland if we had one meter sea level rise. So not very much in that in that particular area. Um, so once we have that sort of area where marsh could potentially go, um, now there's a bunch of limitations on uh, on whether you know vegetation could occupy all that area, and you know there are many many land uses within that that range, um, um, and some you know eventually I think everything will succumb to sea level rise as as, as we've seen through you know destruction of parking lots through storms and stuff, but. Uh, um, at least for, for a while, some of these land use categories, they're going to uh, severely limit or prevent uh, marsh from, from migrating. For example, you have a concrete uh, uh, parking lot or, or you know, the development, there's not going to be much migration there. But the, the, the more um, passive types of land uses will allow for that.
Uh, and then when we when we constrain migration further by slopes of the uh, existing upland, we get a little less area to, to work with. Uh, but essentially, uh, this is the, the last few minutes of the presentation, but I'll, and I'll, I'll try not to go over this too quickly. But when we do this modeling, um, these are these marsh. This uh, column on the left represents the Gut Marsh, Hatches Harbor, Jeremy Marsh, uh, Middle Meadow, Nosset, Pleasant Bay, and West End. And there's a lot of numbers here to see. I know, but uh, essentially, what we see from this modeling is that we have a huge opportunity to expand the amount of marsh we have at Hatches Harbor. I'll show that in detail a little bit further here. Uh, but at Nosset Marsh, we almost lose the whole thing. 12% of it is left with one meter of sea level rise compared to you know the, its area in 2013 aerial photography. The rest show either losses or slight gains. Um, uh, depending on the uh, the system and the amount of available um, habitat that they can migrate to, um, so that was that was totally unconstrained migration scenario there, not constrained by land use or slopes at all. And it looks like this. So here's an area of Hatches Harbor. This white area is where marshes can go, and they can essentially wrap around this whole dunes and and go way back through the dunes. Um, not much area to work with in West End Marsh, or um, Middle Meadow or the Gut and Wellfleet. Um, little, uh, most of the migration opportunity occurs along the, the Barrier Beach in Pleasant Bay and then again in, in Nosset. Because it's an island marsh, it's not connected to the upland, really worried that that's just going to disappear because it's got nowhere to go essentially. Um, and then if you do put land use and slope constraints, which is you know probably more reflective of reality, we can see that again, um, so this, uh, this this green line's in the wrong place. I meant to highlight Hatches Harbor. We, we, we were actually able to still gain a lot of marsh. This is area gained through migration. But again, that NASA system is, is, is probably going to collapse almost completely. And in total, we're losing 159 uh, hectares of marsh. Um, uh, other migration related issues, you know, we'll have to <laughs> We'll have to work with uh, land managers and, and, and coastal managers and scientists. We'll have to work with landowners and, and uh, you know see if opportunities for migration can be provided. Um, for example, in Pleasant Bay alone, there's you know over 2,000 different land ownership parcels that would be affected by sea level rise. And again, uh, the erosion of these barrier islands and spits really takes is going to take away a lot of habitat. Um, for marshes to migrate to, unless all that sand, you know, helps helps build elevation to the point where Pleasant Bay, the existing footprint of the marsh could persist, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, again, when it when when all these constraints are are put on migration, again, this is the slide I think I meant to show before. We go still get a lot out of Hatches Harbor. Um, but we're losing almost all of Nosset Marsh and, and the rest of the marshes too also start to lose significant habitat. Uh, and again, this is just a photo of Hatches Harbor where we can get a lot of migration all the way up through the dunes here. Um, this, this, the sticky issue is the airport still resides in the floodplain and we have all this infrastructure as well. Um, nevertheless, sea, sea level is doing its thing regardless of us. And, um, over the last two years, the sea level rise has created this new channel that comes around the Hatches Harbor dike and is pouring into that marsh now. Uh, you can see that. Basically, my point with, for showing this slide is that, you know, the ocean will not be kept out. <laughs> so we're going to have to uh, make plans to, to move infrastructure and really try to allow for, for this resource to, to adapt. Um, and then final thing that I want to say is it may be necessary to take some pretty radical management steps and we are looking into elevation augmentation projects for our marshes to to get them uh, some some quick elevation in order to, to be able to adapt to sea level rise better and and preserve them for longer essentially. So thank you very much for listening. I know I went over a little bit. Um, apologize for that. Um, anyway, that's it. No, oh, you're right on time. Thank you okay. so much, Stephen. So we that was a great presentation. I just learned a bunch. Uh, we are, so I'm going to put my camera back on. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of questions uh, in the chat box. So I'm going to um, just start getting to people's questions. So the first was a ge geographic question. Can you please just remind us where Hatches Harbor is? Yeah, sorry. Uh, if I could, can I share my screen again to do this? Will that work? I think so. Okay, yeah, hold on. Please try. Let, me, let me get this back here. I'll just pull up a slide. 
it shows them all. Um, just a second. Where are we? Here we go. So Hatches Harbor is right up here. And, um, you know, there was a dike built across that marsh uh, in about 1930s for some mosquito, you know, reduction. And, you know, coincidentally, the airport went in shortly thereafter. But um, John Portnoy was, you know, the one to sort of spearhead the effort to get that, uh, the, um, the openings in the dike enlarged and try to, you know, it was our first tidal restoration project, really. And, and that started in 1998. And it's, it's been phenomenal success. Um, it's still it's still increasing its its, its uh, recovery area. So um, that's where that one is. And then, you know, the one thing I did, the one huge issue I never got into that's really, really impacting these marshes heavily from the West End down through Wellfleet Bay and such is uh, Susarma crab herbivory, which is these uh, herbivorous crabs whose populations have gotten way out of control, probably due to loss of some predation pressure. Um, they are decimating our marshes. They're they're eating them down, and and as a result, we're losing you know thousands of years of peat buildup in single storm events during the winter. So, um, anyway, that's a that's a different issue to be depressed about at a on a later date. But uh, so another Hatches Harbor question, since you got yeah. the map up, um, is the potential gain at Hatches Harbor due to the fact that it was historically diked and trained, or is it just something about the geography in general? It's it's um. It's the geography in general. If I do this, can you see this? Google Earth? All right, it's- um, We can see your slide. Oh, you can see the slide, oh, the slide. Uh, okay, let me go back to that then. Um, We're seeing uh, how has salt marsh vegetation changed in Cape Cod National Seashore marshes over time? Gotcha, um, so I just wanted to pull up a slide. I think it's at the end here. Of, here we go. Okay, so yep. basically it's really flat through here through the through you know through these dunes is all kind of freshwater natural cranberry bogs the elevation is pretty low and so you know when they're not up against steep slopes marshes and they've already started to do it um i don't know if you can see right in here i don't know if you can see my cursor or not but um i can see your cursor you can okay so right in here the marshes is, has already started to migrate through this little channel now it's already broken through here, but you know the the topography of this is such that there's a lot of area there, and there's no pavement. There's no that you know you have this road here in the Promised Land Visitor Center and the airport. That's you know those are the big problems, but uh, they're not huge compared to the kind of development that's you know normally seen adjacent to to, to coastal marshes. So uh, in in many areas that are not protected, you know that the marshes are getting squeezed out of existence because sea level rise is, is you know getting them from their, 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 their the seaward edge and but they have nowhere to go because they're right up against you know a shopping mall or or you know housing development so um in, in a sense we are lucky but um it, there's really there's really only one place where we can we can see significant migration now i should add that um future events, sea level rise and storms and stuff will alter the topography of the adjacent upland to some extent. So, um, you know, it's possible that a storm could, could blow out a big dune and make it flat enough to, you know, to provide for some upland migration. But, but the reason the hatches is special is mainly because of its topography and uh, it's really, sh um, you know, gentle slopes and the, the absence of infrastructure. Interesting. Thank you. So we've got two questions uh, that have to do with sea level rise projections. Okay. So first is, uh, can you speak to the projected time frame of sea level rise in relation to the accretion rates? Now, are we looking at sea level rise inundating existing high marsh within 10, 20, 30 years or a different amount? Um, well, it, it, sure, it, it depends. Uh, like right now, the sea level rise is vastly outpacing our marsh's ability to deal to, to, to keep vertically accreting with it. So um, it, sea level rise is a bit complicated because while it's rising, um, there's there's a lot of uh, both seasonal and interannual variability in tides that has to do with all, all kinds of variables, um, including wind and ocean circulation patterns and atmospheric circulation patterns and uh, barometric pressure and, and anyway. Um, 
but these this modeling was done um, you know the the sort of final product maps represent what we would expect our marshes to look like by the year 2100. Um, the, the modeling suggests a continuous acceleration of sea level rise um, to the point where globally um, you know levels are about a meter to a meter and a half above current levels. That'll be different everywhere in the world because relative sea level rise is not just determined by um, you know, global sea level rise, but it, as I said before, it's determined by, by wind patterns and atmospheric circulation, ocean circulation, and uh, water temperatures, and um, whether the land mass itself is subsiding or uplifting. In Alaska, sea level rise is actually falling in places because the land is being uplifted, but it's not really. Um, so it, it's kind of variable, but the, the, the modeling we did was based on a meter of sea level, or the most um, catastrophic scenario was a meter of sea level rise, and the newer modeling suggests that that's very likely to happen, and probably on the on the um, uh, on the low end of of what we might expect. So, um, I don't know if that Thanks. got your question. In, in terms of right rates, like we're right right now, sort of at 3.5 millimeters per year, which doesn't seem like much, but it is if you're a marsh. And by 2100, they're up around six to 11 millimeters per year. Thank you. So another question, I think um, someone picked up on one of the numbers in your presentation. So the question is where, like geographically on the Cape, are we going to lose two kilometers of shoreline? Two kilometers of shoreline. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure what that means exactly. Um, you know, in terms of shoreline change, it's mostly due to erosion. So I, I think maybe, um, I was making the point about some of the barrier beach systems, um, like in uh, like in Pleasant Bay, for example. Here, um, you know, the, these barrier spits are, are basically fragile in the face of you know this kind of sea level rise we're experiencing, and and so with this this coastal erosion from the east. Um, which is happening at a, at a pretty quick rate in, in some spaces that there's just not going to be that coastal shoreline to to migrate to. There's not going to be anything to migrate to. Now, as I said, there's some benefit of sand from this the, these beaches overwashing and, and you know creating some elevation, um, like possibly creating uh, conditions for new marsh to form behind it. But um, so far, we haven't seen much of that. Thank you. And we've got one more question and um, yeah. I'm going to add a little bit to it. So the question is, have we moved beyond a point where it's enough to simply remove constraints. Um, are there more active things that we can do to help the marshes? I noticed one of your last slides, you looked at, um, right. at elevation enhancement, I think you called yes. it. So um, this thing know, permitting wise, that is also sometimes called filling of marshes. So yeah, has, yeah, yeah. has there been any uh, movement on you know the permitting side of things to allow communities and national parks to, to try this method out? It, this has been tried Actually, it's pretty commonplace now, um, you know, on relatively small scales, but uh, lots of people are doing this and hopefully <laughs> the permitting process has gotten better, but it's it's amazing how uh, um, how difficult it is to try to restore a marsh. I mean, that John Portnoy could give hours and hours <laughs> of, of presentation on that alone, but um, I think that um, the science is still sort of new on whether this thin layer um, deposit, I mean, it works. It, it, it's it, There's plenty of examples of it working really well, but it depends on the marsh uh, conditions, the antecedent marsh condition itself, very site-specific conditions, the type of sediment that's used, how much of it's put on, et cetera, et cetera. So we did some actually small-scale experiments with um, adding sand, uh, about 15 to 20 meters of sand to, to, to plots in the West End Marsh in order to get that get actually elevation augmentation as well as to discourage sasarma crabs from inhabiting those areas because they hate sand, they can't burrow in it. And um, it was re actually really successful. So we would love to expand that out to larger spatial scales, which is what we're going to try to do. But again, the permitting is is probably the big thing that, um, that the big obstacle in doing that. But um, it's, it's being done more and more. And I think we're at the point where all of us at the seashore at least feel like, okay, it's time to maybe, you know, uh, we're tired of getting reporting, just reporting on the bad news and we really need to do something 
you know, we need to get out on the ground and, and do something, you know, out of the box or, or, or really, you know, significant to help these things or else, you know, we're going to have to accept that we're, we're just losing them. Um, and I, in my mind, it makes the restoration projects like Herring River, where we're going to get back some of this marsh, all the more important because it, it, it offsets the losses. So. Um, and you know, in terms of other things that we can do, yeah, uh, I think land planning, urban planning, land management, you know, to 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 keep these these migration scenarios in mind when we're when we're doing these things. And you know, Seashore's already done it with the Herring Cove parking lot and beach and stuff. We realize we got to move stuff back and and provide room. So. Thank you very much, Stephen. And that's actually a perfect segue um, to our next speaker. So uh, picture us all giving you a round of applause. <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you. And I did see that there's some um, folks that typed in some more questions for Stephen. So uh, if we have time uh, after we go through uh, the questions for Megan, um, then we can go back to those. So our next speaker is Megan Eagle, and she works with the US Geological Survey. And she's going to present on coastal wetlands and sea level rise, what happens behind dikes, culverts, and other tidal restrictions. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. It's uh, great to be able to present. And um, I'm very happy to be able to follow Stephen um, because he laid an amazing groundwork for um, moving us into uh, not necessarily our natural wetlands, but some of our managed wetlands. So I'm sure all of you recognize um, Wellfleet um, or uh, Herring River here. This is the Phragmites patch um, right uh, upstream of the dike. And we're going to talk about what happens behind these dikes and culverts and other tidal restrictions in respect to sea level rise, now that you guys have all primed on what happens in our natural marshes. Um, so. Uh, Stephen went over kind of the, the ecosystem uh, services that we have, so I'll speed through some of the front part of my talk. Um, but one of the things that he really talked about is this dynamic biogeophysical, biogeophysical feedbacks between the sea and the marsh, and that's responsible for producing the um, accretion that we see. And one thing that Steve mentioned is that uh, organic accretion is super important for our marshes here, and I'm just demonstrating that with a, a picture of sand versus marsh peat. And you can see this is the same mass of material, but the marsh peat has a greater volume. And so this um, accumulation of marsh peat is super important for building elevation in our marshes. Um, and so that is one of the things that we try to encourage the growth of, um, as well as the uh, deposition of mineral material um, in these systems. So we have to think about how these processes are disrupted. Um, when we move from a natural marsh, which we just learned a lot about, where we have daily tidal exchange um, and the link between the vegetation um, and the sea is very tightly coupled, um, that's creating that accretion response um, and through preservation of organic matter and trapping. So we have to think, okay, what happens when we move from this system um, to a different system. And that's important because in New England, we have an awful lot of marshes that have been um, altered. Um, and so, right, the estimates now are that 50% of the area that we had at colonization um, has been lost oh, yes. to development. Um, Could you mute the there's, uh, So there's someone that needs to mute themselves. And Jeanette, can you hit mute all for you? Great, I'll start talking. Yeah, okay. Um, so, and then we have half of this uh, wetland left, but that wetland isn't all in um, the condition that we might think of as wetland. And then, so half of what we have that's called wetland is actually um, drained, farmed, flooded um, with fresh water it's, or some sort of altered or managed state. Um, and this has important consequences for the ecosystem benefits we actually want out of these systems. So um, in impoundment, which is when we put a structure in place um, that yeah. alters tidal flow, with the Herring River Dike being a very um, good obvious example, but this could be um, some an undersized culvert, this could oh, be a man. berm or other feature. Um, and the implications for the ecosystem of the, the wetland that's above that 
are critical. Um, we have work looking at how it interacts with the climate cycle, but a key component is what's going on with the um, soil carbon cycling, as well as the sediment supply, because the dike not only cuts off water delivery from the ocean and that exchange, but it also cuts off the sediment supply that would come in with that water. Um, and so where are these impoundments? Um, this is an atlas of tidal impoundments for um, Buzzards Bay, and you can see they're very ubiquitous. Um, in Massachusetts alone, we have over 600 of them. Um, and there's about 1.2 million acres across the continental U.S. of tidally impounded wetlands. Um, and so these are critical. Um, if you've been to uh, uh, Woods Hole, you'll notice this is the Shining Sea Bikeway, which is actually um, uh, serves as an impoundment to most of the uh, back uh, the, or the wetlands that were behind the barrier beaches um, in this part of the Cape um, with significant impoundments. Um, you can see here uh, a bot uh, like a pond that used to be a former wetland. We also have a lot of drained um, wetlands. A lot of times wetlands are drained first and then can become impounded. And there's about uh, half a million acres of those in the US and that they were commonly done for farming or for some other land uh, use purpose. Um, and these represent areas that are at uh, enhanced um, uh, threat from sea level rise because they're non-resilient, typically have elevation loss. Um, and so the Herring River in the Cape Cod National Seashore was about a thousand acres um, of uh, salt marsh at the time it was restricted. And um, as Steve mentioned, there's proposed for restoration and it contains both drained and freshened and impounded formal salt marshes. And so we've been doing some work there on the soil history of um, the site. Uh, but first, I'm gonna just show you, this is um, a map I got from Tim Smith at uh, National Seashore um, that shows the history of management in the Herring River. And you can see people have been managing hydrology for a very long time in this wetland. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a, a big history of, of that uh, imprinted on the wetland. And here's some actual pictures of, of the first dike. Um, this isn't the one that's currently there. It has been rebuilt since, um, but this was when they uh, decided to uh, cut off that supply um, in hopes, I think, of creating a better environment for tourism. Um, and so uh, we talked about how important this link is between um, the, the sea and the upland. And I just wanted to use this as a cartoon to show you what happens when you um, when you dike a wetland. And so the tide range really controls that distribution of the intertidal marsh. That's where the high and low marsh. So we saw a lot of aerial um, images of actually measured vegetation and projected vegetation in the last talk. And um, in Cape Cod, uh, we have this fresh groundwater lens that's actually kind of perched right on the edge of the sea. And so the upland vegetation is controlled by um, the depth to that gr fresh groundwater, while the salt marsh vegetation is controlled by the tidal range. And so what happens when we dike it um, is that we prevent the sea from coming in and we actually um, cause a, a, a drain of that water. And so we are allowing then upland uh, species to move into areas where they don't normally um, exist. So those upland species are actually invading into what was a former salt marsh. And here you can see, this is a tidal range, both inside and outside of um, Herring River. And you can see the reduced tidal range. Um, uh, and this has resulted in the drainage and impoundment of a large uh, area. And so what happens when you drain that? Um, Critically, you pull the water out. That uh, water allows um, oxygen through the air to enter the pore spaces. And that organic matter, which we um, saw just provides a large amount of volume, is exposed to an environment that is conducive to it decomposing. And, and that then is lost um, to the atmosphere. Um, and the pore spaces that hold the mineral apart actually collapse. And so you get... Um, elevation loss. And across the Herring River, the elevation loss is pretty significant, up to actually a little over a meter now. Um, and so I'm going to show you some data from um, cores in the Herring River um, across the different uh, ecosystems. So there's, you know, trees in the Herring River, there's shrubs, there's uh, cattails, and then there's phragmites. And then we're going to also look at some cores um, that were taken across several uh, hydrologic restorations on Cape Cod as a potential analog um, for Herring River. 
So first for the Herring River site, what I'm showing you here is the water table depth. So this is where the water table is relative to the land surface. Land surface is at zero. And this is just to show that um, there is this cascading um, change in vegetation, and that's a direct result of the water table across the Herring River um, ecosystem. And so where we have the most flooded conditions, we have Phragmites, where we have slightly less flooded and fresher conditions, we have cattails. And then that falls with shrubs. Um, they're not permanently flooded, although the water table is very close to the surface. You can see it's usually about 20 centimeters. And then we have trees where the water table is typically um, more than a half a meter below the surface. And so this hydrology really controls um, what, uh, what uh, a vegetation, terrestrial vegetation is occurring in the Herring River uh, current impounded regions. So we went and took some cores from these sites, and these are just pictures of the cores there where we put a plastic tube into the sediment and we then pull that tube out full of sediment and we can analyze that and learn about what happened in the past. And so these are the um, elevation trajectories of the Herring River sites. And so one thing I want you to first note is this marsh, which is at the gut, is higher than all the other ecosystems in Herring River. And so that's a little strange. You, you shouldn't normally um, have a marsh that's higher than an oak tree, um, but that's what has happened due to the impoundment and the subsequent loss of elevation. And we can learn a couple of different things from this plot. The first is that um, elevation has been lost since impoundment. And so what we do is we compare the elevation back um, in the uh, early 1900s. And so we are using the assumption there that the marsh was at a similar elevation across the entire Herring River. It's not a perfect assumption, but um, typically salt marshes don't have massive elevation changes across them. Just by their very nature, they like to be flooded um, and they're responding all to the same sea level. And so we then can um, uh, estimate how much elevation has been lost across these different portions of the Herring River. Um, so that that results that um, uh, result is an you know is what is lost due to that diking. Um, there, the evidence um, from the Phragmites site, which was our lowest site, is that it didn't actually grow on a former sub, uh, marsh; it grew on a subtidal, like a sandbar. And so that isn't an elevation loss um, because that probably wasn't marsh to start with. Um, however, we can also look at what have the changes been since in, impoundment and diking occurred. And so we can think about that is how steep is this arrow here? And the steepness of that arrow we just saw is largely driven by a sea level rise response. And so the marsh is trying to keep up with sea level rise. Um, it's not doing a perfect job, but it's trying. But you can see these other arrows are tend to be a lot flatter. And that means that these areas, um, while they are responding in this likely due to groundwater rise beneath them, are not responding at the same rate. And that um, difference actually represents um, a decrease in resilience capacity since diking, and also a decrease in carbon storage because that, um, that material that builds those marshes is largely organic and, and has a lot of carbon. And so we can actually partition then how much carbon was lost due to the diking versus how much carbon a burial was avoided due to diking. And you can see both contribute significantly across the Herring River. Um, this is carbon, uh, tons of carbon um, since 1910. So what's going to happen um, if Herring River is restored? Um, and so there's not a great analog for Herring River because it's a massive uh, restoration and there haven't been a lot of massive restorations, but we do have a lot of small restorations. Um, but I'd like to note that eight Eight, foot, eight feet here is a lot smaller than the 165 foot span of the Herring River. And so um, this is in Quivet Creek where they replaced a small culvert. And so while these aren't great, we do have some places where we can use um, to, to serve as analogs for a potential hydro hydrologic restoration. And so this study um, did a bunch of things. This is just a, a schematic of what it was. We took sediment cores, which are these nice yellow uh, circles um, in a marsh that hadn't been diked, and then also upstream of a marsh that had been diked. And um, this red X uh, represents where the tidal restriction occurred. Um, we put wells in these marshes, we monitored the creek levels, and we took a lot of sediment cores to understand um, a little bit about 
uh, what had happened in the, in the two parts of the marsh. And I'll note that um, at the time the data was collected, the, core, the marshes had been um, restored between three and 14 years. So our first is water elevation. And the reason I'm showing you this is it's answering the question is, was hydrologic um, conditions restored? And for the five sites, Bass Creek, Boat Meadow, Quivet, and Stony Brook, the answer is yes. Um, you'll see the uh, orange natural marsh and the green restored marsh have very similar patterns. And that means the water was the same um, um, on both sides of that former restriction. The um, example that doesn't meet that is Scusset Creek. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about Scusset Creek. So we'll, we'll shelve that, but note that Scusset Creek um, has not re had its full return to um, the full tidal range. Um, and then what about the water table? So this is on the marsh platform, how, how much water um, is held within the marsh. And so that's within the peat itself. And you'll see they're largely the same. These are histograms. And so the, the, um, the one that has the highest peak is, is where the, the peak of the water table is. And it's mostly to show that there's a lot of similarity between the restored and the natural. So conditions have been restored, except for again at Scusset Creek. So we're gonna keep, keep calling out Scusset Creek and then we'll look at that a little bit closer in just a second. Um, and then these are the elevations of the marsh through time. So this is the last hundred years, um, except for Scusset, where we don't have the full hundred years in the restored marsh. Um, and I wanna note two things, um, Bass and Quivet, the restored marsh is actually at a higher elevation currently than the natural marsh. Um, these, these are the core traces. So these are the points and the, the small points of the marsh where we're able to go back in time. But the um, big numbers on the screen represent a survey of between one and 300 points across the marsh where we did RTK, like Stephen mentioned in his talk. And you'll see that's the average um, elevation difference. And the, the green ones are where the natural marsh is, is actually um, lower, and so the restored marsh is higher, and then the uh, the orange symbols are where the uh, restored marsh is is has got an elevation deficit. And so you'll see the elevation deficit at Boat was 14, Stony Brook was 20 centimeters, and Scusset is 70 centimeters. So it has a significant elevation difference. Overall, our um, natural marshes were able to accrete at a faster pace than our restored marshes were. Um, and this trace does include both their post-restoration as well as um, pre-restoration elevations. I'd like to call out again Scusset. You'll see there is an extremely sharp um, uptick in Scusset's elevation after restoration. So what, what happened at Scusset? Um, I was actually able to get water level elevation from 1995, which is before Scusset happened. So first, this is Scusset Marsh. This is the Cape Cod Canal, and here's the restriction. And um, the Army Corps is the one that did this restoration. And um, when they, they don't have any water level through time. And so we have this snapshot in, in um, pre-restoration which is what happened um, in 1995 before the restoration was done. And then we have this one that uh, we collected uh, um, in 2019. And so this is post-restoration. And you can see they, um, they, did, they didn't get the full tidal range back, but they greatly increased it. Um, and so it increased the amplitude, but they're not back to where they used to be. Um, however, that marsh has been gaining elevation at a centimeter a year since restoration, um, which is way um, much higher rates of accretion than any of the other marshes that we've seen. And so the thought is, you know, is this a, a better analog for Herring River just because it had the large elevation deficit? Um, and in some ways it, it might be, I don't think the Army Corps has been very deliberate in their elevation accretion response, um, which is what is planned for Herring River. Um, but it could tell us that some of these marshes um, are capable of, of considerable elevation gain. And this has all been organic. There is very little sediment coming through the tide gate that exists here now. Um, so I just wanna note, you know, does age matter? It's a little inconclusive. So these are, you know, accretion rate versus age um, for the restored marshes here, the natural marshes that we're seeing on the north side of Cape Cod. 
Um, but what really does matter um, is the flooding history. And so that marsh um, was getting um, at Scusset up here, which was getting just enough uh, water to really enhance its vegetation response and storage capacity um, and not be drowned. And so just some take home messages is that um, tidal impoundment and drainage has resulted in landscapes with lower elevation and carbon storage potential, and they're not as resilient. Um, but you know, hydrology, whether it's groundwater or seawater is really going to drive these and groundwater and seawater are coupled even um, behind and in front of uh, impoundments. These restored marshes can grow and overcome elevation deficits. There's going to be a limit to what they can um, overcome. So adaptive management is probably critical of both water and surface elevation. And we need more and better models um, to try to make some of these predictions because our current marsh models are always very good at capturing management um, decisions. And I'll just leave you guys and answer questions on this um, uh, final slide. It was a, a lot of effort and funding um, that went into uh, all of these marsh work that we've done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. That was great. Um, while we're waiting for questions, can you please go back to the slide that had all of the um, the cores from the different parts of the marsh? That was fascinating to see the differences. So uh, can you just walk us through this slide a little bit? Tell us what we're seeing in here. Yeah, so um, I'll start over on the right. So this is a salt marsh core, and these are the tops of all the cores. Um, so the top is up here, go down, and you can see these are really defined root structures. And so this is that organic matter that I was talking about. So the plants um, photosynthesize and they fix that organic matter as root material, and, the, and, and that really forms this kind of base of peat. And so this is what a healthy salt marsh looks like. The restored marshes, um, they tend to have processes like impoundment or other things that have really um, altered the organic cycling that is going on and they're very mucky. Um, and so they don't have as much in structural integrity um, as the a natural salt marsh. These other four um, ones are different ecosystems that are exist at the Herring River. And those are um, terrestrial ecosystems that are, are freshwater wetlands that are actually growing into relic salt marsh. Um, and so we can use carbon isotopes. So that's like the, a tracer of the terrestrial plant material versus the salt marsh plant material. And we can confirm that, you know, in this forest, um, the trees are growing on top of old salt marsh peat. And so this actually, what you see here is salt marsh peat that um, has been drained and dried for a hundred years with a forest growing on top of it. Um, similar with the shrub and then the typha and the phragmites, so sorry, cattails and phragmites, you can see the large root structures here. Um, that's um, the root is trying to aerate the soil um, because um, hydrogen sulfide and other anoxic uh, or anoxic conditions can produce hydrogen sulfide and that is a toxin. And so, so the they like the trade typha that we're seeing, those, those are roots, those white things in there? Yes, those are roots. So you see they're actually hollow. I don't know if you guys can see that in the picture. Sort of. Yeah, sorry. And so those are attached to the stalks. And so these uh, plants are phenomenal. They can actually pump um, uh, oxygen down. That is so cool. Um, okay, so question is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, how does the draining of the underground aquifers on Cape Cod by human water use interact with the rise of sea level? And then yeah, the next so is, is Cape Cod collapsing on itself or is it being flooded? Yeah, so that's um, a great question. And, you know, see, uh, human human extraction of water is definitely important. Um, but we, one, it's it's typically seasonal. Um, and two, it, it can be pretty localized to the, to the well itself. Um, and so we aren't seeing um, that impact on the groundwater levels right at the coast. Um, and so, you know, we do see a seasonal drawdown. So in the summer, when all the plants are super active and, and they are drawing down that groundwater, we actually do see a depression in groundwater. Um, but over time, um, that, that freshwater lens is, is actually rising up on um, the seawater. And Stephen actually has a paper that he published looking at this. Um, and, and the rate is similar to sea level rise. And so eventually, especially in these coastal areas where the water table is very shallow, that will rise and flood 
Thank you. And if folks have more questions for Megan, you can type them into the chat box. Um, and then this is a question for both you, Megan, and Stephen. Um, you both touched on this in your presentations, but um, if you could sort of summarize, what actions are there that could be taken by towns or the region or the state uh, that could mitigate or prevent further impacts of sea level rise on our, our marshes? Yeah, I think Stephen mentioned some of them and we can you know, reiterate it, it is going to actually probably take active management at this point, And that is, you know, managing those um, migration pathways in terms of, you know, giving them space, the marshes space, as well as is taking some active management. If we are identifying marshes that we I think are really critical to keep. Um, maybe enhancing their elevation or or doing something like that. But I, I wholeheartedly agree, agree that, you know, our marshes are in a tough spot um, and it is going to take uh, active influence. And so I guess one thing I would say is, you know, as a local resident, a lot of our actions on, on wetlands are done at a local level. Um, and so, you know, if, if there is something coming before a planning board where they're trying to get, you know, permission to, alter a wetland or do something like that, just, you know, be aware of that and try to advocate for not losing these uh, ecosystems um, because they are very hard to replace. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. And then Stephen, do you have thoughts on that question? No, I, I think she pretty much covers it there. I mean, really, there's land management planning to make room for migration. There's active management, elevation, augmentation and such. Um, you know, there, there are other issues related to marshes like, you know, the whole Sasarma crab or bivory and it's linked to, you know, potential decline in, in predatory fish. Well, here's a great example. West End Marsh in Provincetown suffering the effects of sea level rise, but it's also bounded by this stone breakwater, which I think lots of people probably walked out there to Long Point. Um, the breakwater is permeable. It doesn't really affect tides too much. But what it does probably is affect sediment transport in and out of that marsh. And for sure, there's no fish getting in there to eat any of the crabs, particularly the Sasarma crabs that have absolutely exploded in there in the last five years and are doing massive amounts of damage. So if we simply knocked a couple, we see it's the, the actual actual structure is it's complicated. The seashore doesn't own it and all that. So. Uh, again, getting into these permitting issues, but all we need to do is blow a hole, a couple of holes with and put a bridge over top of that breakwater. And then you can at least get some predatory fish in there and maybe begin to manage a bit of that problem. But uh, I think it's going to take some creative thinking outside the box to to preserve these systems. Um, you know, the other thing that uh, that is concerning is that the, the Gulf of Maine is actually the fastest uh, warming body of water on planet Earth right now. Um, so, you know, those changes uh, mean a lot too. And, you know, particularly for marshes, um, there's been some recent publications showing that, you know, both air temperature and water temperature increases reduce a marsh's ability to accrete organic matter, peat. It, it, it's simply bacteria like the warmer temperatures, they decompose it faster. Um, so, to, you know, you're not getting that peat build up as much, but. I mean, that's not something somebody can do on a local level, but um, I think it's just going to take a lot of land, land planning and even planning for future projects should, you know, take these things into consideration. So. Thank and you, Stephen. Yeah, then again, some of the feel good things that you can do to ameliorate this is you know, restore marshes where we can. It's outside the permitting, as John Portnoy once said. Uh, very eloquently, all you got to do is let the water back in. <laughs> it just does itself. So it's not quite as simple as that. But um, you know, I, I think in the in the interim, where we can get pieces of marsh back, um, you know, without too much uh, uh, pain, then it's worth, it's worth doing, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, we've got one more question for Megan, and then we'll wrap up. Um, how will or well, I guess how will and if uh, will Herring River restoration affect greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, that wasn't a focus of this talk, but um, we are actively studying those as well. And there's two ways that it will affect it. Um, one, we're going to enhance carbon burial just because the marshes are the most efficient at burying carbon. 
And one of that, one of the reasons behind that is because as they respond to sea level rise, they are increasing, um, you're essentially increasing that, that ability or that space where carbon is stored. Um, and so salt marshes are very good at storing carbon. So that's atmospheric carbon, pulling it down. The second is when you have impoundment and freshening, you um, are switching from um, the organic matter decomposing via either oxic respiration or sulfate reduction um, to a process called methanogenesis. And that's just because the, meth the microbes have to breathe something and when they run out of oxygen and they run out of sulfate, they, they consume organic matter to decompose it. And so um, you produce methane. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, and so by reducing or introducing tidal exchange, again, you reduce that. And so we have a lot of work going on about that and about the, the carbon or the greenhouse gas consequences. And they, and they are substantial. Um, and I, yeah. Thank you very much, Megan. I'm um, picture us all giving you a round of applause virtually. So thank you both. Um, we are going to wrap up. Um, so. Thank you for trying out the virtual conference platform with us. Um, I, I think it works pretty well. If there are things that we can do differently for next week, because we have two more Saturdays that we're going to do uh, the Harbor Conference, um, just type it in the chat box. Any suggestions you have where we can make things a little bit better, or if there was something that you liked in particular that worked really well for you. Um, so thank you for your excellent questions, your patience, your enthusiasm. And the planning committee looks forward to seeing you next week uh, for talks about Wellfleet Harbor wildlife. And we're going to learn about the latest research on great white sharks and diamondback terrapins. And I'm going to close with a poem that Mary McHugh wrote for us for the 10th anniversary of the Harbor Conference. So it's a haiku of hope for Wellfleet Harbor. Inspire a fleet and call all hands on deck to make the harbor well. So thank you everyone and have a lovely Saturday and we'll see you here next weekend.